attacks. Tonight, four Gitmo soldiers have come forward, revealing in a Harper's Magazine exclusive what really happened that night and how the cover-up is now being maintained by the Obama administration. The Pentagon first claimed the men had hanged themselves to attack the U.S. in a bit of asymmetrical warfare. Based on a Seton Hall Law School analysis of the redacted report, Navy investigators and CIS apparently concluded that the detainees somehow obtained enough cloth to make mannequins of themselves in their beds, to block surveillance cameras, to then braid makeshift nooses tied eight feet high on the wall, to shove more cloth down their own throats beyond the point of gagging, that they tie their hands together, then climb up on their sinks, at least one of them with his feet bound as well, get their heads through the nooses, tighten them, and drop to their deaths simultaneously in separate, non-adjacent cells. After our newscast reporting that story, interviewing Scott Horton of Harper's Magazine, one of the viewers that night contacted Mr. Horton. The viewer was Joe Hickman, former Gitmo sergeant of the Army National Guard's 629th Military Intelligence Battalion, who was stationed at Tower One that night and noticed a Navy paddy wagon taking a prisoner from Camp One and then take a left, which led only to the super-secret Guantanamo site known as Camp No. Camp No's existence was unknown till today. The Obama administration has not acknowledged its existence. After the van retrieved a second prisoner, Hickman went to a checkpoint where he visually confirmed, after the van got a third prisoner, that Camp No was the destination. The Obama administration's official story still today is that the guards took all three to the clinic from their cells in Camp One after finding the first of them at 12.39 in the morning. But Hickman had been back in Tower One by 11.30 at night and saw the paddy wagon unload something at the clinic directly from Camp No. A guard at Tower Four, also with a clear line of sight, corroborated to Horton Hickman's claim that no one was brought from Camp One to the clinic. The next morning, Harper's reports, Colonel Michael Bumgarner told Gitmo guards the detainees choked on rags, but not to dispute the official story of hanging. Today, Bumgarner denied nothing specific, quote, this blatant misrepresentation of the truth infuriates me. I don't know who Sergeant Hickman is, but he's only trying to be a spotlight ranger. He knows nothing about what transpired in Camp One or our medical facility. I do. I was there. Except that on June 17th of that year, in a sworn statement to NCIS, Baumgartner had written, quote, on the night of 09 June 06, uh, I was not in the is camp. on newsstands February 15th. It's online now at harpers.org. Welcome back. Great to be with you. All right. Sergeant Hickman approached you after our last interview here. Why? What does he think happened? And what does he want now? Well, he watched Countdown, mm -hmm. uh, and he saw our description and summation of the Seton Hall report, uh, and he wanted to add pieces that were missing from the puzzle. Uh, and in fact, he added quite a few. Uh, I've spent most of the last month dealing with him and his colleagues, piecing things together, and I have to say their accounts add up perfectly. I see no problem with them, uh, and they contradict uh, decisively the official narrative uh, that uh, uh, that uh, the Joint Task Force in Gitmo put out, as well as the Bush administration. Sergeant Hickman uh, gave us an exclusive statement tonight that responds to the statement from Colonel Bumgarner. Let me read that uh, in its entirety. I am disappointed by today's statement from Army Colonel Michael Bumgarner because I know what I witnessed at Guantanamo Bay. I look forward to testifying under oath before Congress at the appropriate venue. I stand by my story. Can you support that? Yeah, I, 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 in fact, I was puzzled by Colonel Baumgartner's uh, statement because, uh, in fact, I know from talking to all these soldiers, including Sergeant Hickman, that uh, they all like Colonel Baumgartner. In fact, I would say their, their statements even reflected a great degree of affection towards him and disappointment that he wound up being uh, dismissed, so there's no animosity to that. Moreover, then, I looked very closely at all of the official narrative that Colonel Baumgartner presented, and there is no conflict between uh, Sergeant Hickman's narrative and Colonel Baumgartner's narrative. Uh, in fact, Colonel Baumgartner makes clear he was not there at the camp all the way up till a quarter to uh, quarter to one in the morning. Uh, and the critical events that form the basis of this narration occurred between seven and roughly midnight. Mm. So who who killed these men? Do you know? We don't know, and I think one thing we should all be uh, uh, cautious about is rushing to any conclusions about how they died. Uh, uh, because previously, the prior investigation uh, was over before it began. It was, they hung themselves in their cells and it was suicide. Uh, that was a decision that was being, or that was a conclusion that was being forced from the top. That's clearly not a correct conclusion. I think now we know where they died. And one of the big questions is, who's the landlord at that facility? Yeah. Who was running it? It really seemed to have been off the map for the Guantanamo Command. 
Uh, many of the soldiers uh, speculated that this was a CIA facility. Other information we see suggests maybe JSOC, the Joint Special Operations Command. Oh. But frankly, I don't think this is something that was being run by the prison guards in the Gitmo Command. So uh, as I referred to it earlier, it's a Gitmo inside a Gitmo. That's correct. The Justice Department pushed back, as I understand it, against you naming names about their people, but not about the specifics. And if they're covering this up then, why are they doing so? Are they doing so unwillingly? And for whom are they doing it? Well, that's an interesting question. In fact, we made some uh, pretty harsh accusations about the Justice Department's role in the cover-up, including uh, the, the position or, or things that had been done by the FBI in the first days uh, after these events, where they appeared to be at attempting to intimidate people, uh, prevent them from talking about what was going on. Uh, we talked about the Justice Department filing what appeared to be false statements with federal court. Uh, no questions raised by the Justice Department about any of that. Uh, in fact, what they came to us with was uh, their severe complaint that certain Justice Department lawyers were identified by name as having appeared in certain interviews. They don't deny that the interviews occurred. They don't deny that what was said in the interviews was said. They just don't want these individual lawyers identified by name. They want them to be anonymous lawyers and FBI agents. Well, that's a, that's a clear and convincing response that would indicate to you that your reporting is somehow flawed in some, some, some superior way. I hate to laugh on this subject, but that's such an extraordinary response. There seems to be nothing to do but laugh in a, in a sad way. Uh, it's disappointing because I think uh, in this entire matter, uh, really one of, the, one of the central failures really seems to be by the Department of Justice, which is not behaving like a law enforcement agency, uh, finding the facts of criminal activity. In fact, the Department of Justice appears to be acting like a criminal defense law firm mm -hmm. uh, that realizes it's closely connected to people who are involved with some very serious heavy lifting crimes and it wants to cover them up. That's not what we expect of our Justice Department. One would hope not. Uh, Attorney Scott Horton, also of Harper's Magazine. Uh, the magazine's out on February 15th, and the story is already good online. Evening. Good evening. The Obama Justice Department says this is not a cover-up, even though we have no idea how the men died, even though we have no idea who found the bodies, even though we have no idea who at Justice determined it's not a cover-up. So this is case closed, right? Well, it's case closed if they had determined what the solution to the case was. Mm. No one knows how they died, where they died or under what circumstances, so it's hard to close that case. And yet they seem to be prepared to do so. Do you have a theory as to why they are? Well, the only theory that I've been able to come up with is that there's some reason why they don't wish to investigate this matter thoroughly. And after all, you do have the gory situation of three people gagging themselves to death, so much so that in some cases the medics had to pry their jaws open with metal implements, breaking teeth in order to pull out the rags. Mm -hmm. Their doc the medical, the Army's own autopsies found they've been dead for hours at the time they were discovered. And you can't have that be the case if the guards have been doing what they're supposed to do, which is walking up and down the rows, seven guards guarding two dozen people, one at least walking the floors constantly, often two, while, as you said, under a video. And we ought to add the fact that perhaps, as with Sherlock Holmes, the dog that didn't bark, mm -hmm. Not a single one of the guards was charged with any dereliction of duty, even though on their watch three people died, and it was their responsibility to prevent it. Did the Justice <laughs> Department, in your assessment, conduct a full investigation of Joe Hickman's story? Well, we went to the Justice Department on February 2nd. We also went to Congress. They asked us, we told them the story, and they asked us why we had gone to Congress as well as to them. We told them no one owned this story, we just wanted to get the truth out. Mm. Within four days, they had sent four senior officials, FBI and DOJ, to Seton Hall Law School to interview and determine what the facts were. For that week, there was a great deal of effort. Nothing happened that we knew of until late April when I was asked for the names of the corroborative witnesses, all of whom are military intelligence experts, gave them to them again, in June, they interviewed one person briefly, and as a military intelligence interrogator, he was not impressed. Nothing happened thereafter. They played telephone tag with one person in August, never spoke to him. And then, in late October, I received a call for asking me why it was that we were going to Congress, complaining about it, and mm -hmm. why we were going to the press. And I said, well, you'd done nothing. And they said, well, there really was nothing going on, nothing to find. 
I pointed out that they had never once spoken to three of the four witnesses we'd given, that ABC had found more witnesses than, they, than that. And when I pointed that out, the conversation ended, and the next morning at 8.30 in the morning in South Baltimore, four people showed up at the house of one of the witnesses, took him to Denny's, asked him a few questions, and on Monday I got a phone call saying that they had now determined that they could not confirm the facts that we had brought to their attention. But they didn't say the investigation was closed. They refused to say whether it was closed or not. And I might add, we have many witnesses to these conversations as well as to the other events that took place, and it just stopped. So as far as we can tell, the investigation began on February 2nd, the intense investigation ended on February 6th, and we know of nothing that happened after that.